All right, hello everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to the December Transportation Lean Forum. All right, so please, just a little reminder, please mute your phone or microphone while others are talking. Everyone should be muted upon entry, but just make sure not to unmute yourself. Um, but do remember to unmute your phone or microphone when you're gonna ask a question. Um, if you don't have a mic, please use the chat. Um, we do have uh, Tess here, one of the other interns, monitoring the chat. So she will get your questions and make sure those are contributed. If you have any challenges, please uh, message our TLF tech support. Um, that will be their name in the, the Zoom. So um, just a little run through, we're gonna do, um, first we're gonna hear from Shar MacArthur from the Idaho uh, Department of Transportation. And then we're gonna move to Mike Hopkins from Georgia. And then Geneva Hoon, actually from here uh, in Denver with us at the Colorado Department of Transportation. And then we'll do a few updates and then we'll have time for our open forum. So that'll be, we'll have time for questions after each presenter, but the open forum will be for any remaining questions or um, just notes for, for the forum. And just a little, little for fun to show you guys, um, our membership is growing. This is a new map that um, the intern Quentin made. So um, just, Kind of fun this is going to be posted soon on our our website so you'll be able to interact and really it's an interactive google map so you can zoom in to the locations which is kind of fun so yeah just a little reminder please visit our website check, check it out we have some tools and resources there and all right i'm just going to hand it over to Shar now okay so can you hear me we can all right, I'm requesting control, just like I was trained. <laughs> and you can go ahead and take over now. You have control. Okay, good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks for joining this really fabulous forum that I find personally and uh, for the organization very valuable. So just a big shout out and thanks to Colorado for hosting this and coordinating the whole thing. And thank you for letting me talk to you today about our 2018 Leadership Summit. Um, this year, we showcased problem solving through teamwork was our theme. And I will give a little bit of history here because maybe not everybody was here the last year or even the year before that when we talked about what we did at Idaho Transportation Department for our Leadership Summit. Uh, originally, when Director Ness started, he started having what he called a, a Leadership Summit where he brought uh, top leaders from throughout Idaho's Department of Transportation into Boise, and it was kind of listened to a bunch of very um, wonderful leaders from across the country, and then everybody would then go home and be able to practice those leadership skills through just listening. Um, you might call it kind of a talking head type of format. Uh, when I started in 2013, I went through one of these leadership summits and the training and development department was working on creating more experiential learnings. And as we were trying to introduce lean into the organization, uh, this was on the foot, the, the heels of rolling out our culture uh, initiative where we were trying to transform the culture into a more constructive culture that had been going on for several years. And as most of you know, transformation efforts take a long, long time, especially when you have to start at the top, train the top leaders, train the next level of leaders. And really, it's about a year effort, the one after the other. So by the time you get to the front line, it's five years down the road. And I'm not a very patient person, and I didn't want to wait for five years. So we came up with this concept. It's kind of a big thing concept to uh, deploying lean into the organization and incorporating it with our leadership summit. Um, the slides are not advancing and I know they're kind of delayed. So um, maybe a little help, Shay. There we go. Um, so when we uh, came up with the Big Bang concept, it was modeled after uh, President's Kaizen that I had been involved with a number of years 
for a number of years in, in my former life uh, when I was with uh, Danaher Fluke uh, Corporation in Seattle. And the idea is, is you bring together teams of people to compete in a Kaizen type event where they each do their own Kaizens and then there's some sort of competition for the best team and bragging rights afterwards. Um, it was a pretty big feat our first year because nobody in the organization had been exposed to lean tools or processes. It was a pretty big success. Um, and then we did it again the second year, uh, improving on that success. And a part of the, the goal was, of course, to create lots of problem solvers, lots of people who understood how to use lean tools in the organization. And that really did take off. So last year um, in, in the uh, summit, we made some changes. Uh, let's see if I can advance this slide. So oh, that slide you're just looking at, that's that's the goals of our summit, and those have stayed the same year after year. Uh, so we're pretty consistent with that. I do need some help advancing that slide again, Shay. Uh, so we- Click the- um, Go ahead. There should be a button. There you go. You should have it now. It uh, ba -ba -ba. There we go. That worked. Um, so, um, things that have stayed the same is our objectives have never changed. Um, we bring in people who participated at the frontline level to help advise us in planning the uh, event, and it's, it's many months of planning and organization. Um, we also take each of our senior leaders, there's uh, about 20, I don't know, 25-ish of them in the organization, and they get assigned to a team, one or two uh, per team, and some of them may have two teams. They always do report out presentations. Uh, the audience who hears the report out get to vote. Um, and then we always do a lessons learned and debriefing afterwards uh, in the summit, like uh, with all of the participants, and we capture that on video. We have some great video, but I didn't attempt to show it today. Uh, the director always addresses the full, uh, the full summit. And we also do awards and recognition for culture, we have specific measures that we are looking for in our constructive culture. And so each team self-assesses where they're at in the constructive culture uh, growth. And then we give awards for the best problem solving. This year we changed some things up and instead of individuals applying, because we had so many teams going on in the organization this year, because of the great work we've been doing in the past with teaching people, we felt like we didn't want to overload the organization with the introduction of new problems. We were already working on so many. We decided to have those teams who were working on problems to apply to the summit. So that was a very different process for us this year. Um, and then those teams brought their problems that they were working on. So we did not have to seed the problems or select problems and assign them to teams. We also focused on the senior leaders um, coaching other leaders to champion the teams, which was a little bit new. And the team got to self-determine their structure of their process, as opposed to us telling them how to do their process, what to do and when to do it. We introduced a pitch and poster session into uh, the mix this year, which uh, in the past, all the teams would just do their problem solving event and then they would come the day of our summit and they would do a 10 to 12 minute presentation. But because we accepted all of the teams who applied, there were 22 teams that applied, which is way too many for a 10 minute presentation in a one day sitting. So what we did is every team got to do a two minute pitch to entice people to come and look at their poster, which further described their problem solving, and then everybody got to vote and the top posters top vote getting posters then moved on to the final round of 15 minute presentations to the full audience. Also because this year so many of the teams were in progress 
and perhaps didn't need the lean training that we had deployed in the past, we introduced a new kind of training called storytelling training this year, which was really teaching people how to tell their stories, which we find is, is a particular challenge in our organization, unless they're fishing stories um, from, from folks going out on their hunting and fishing trips. They're not so good at telling their business stories. So we wanted to do a little work on that. And that was a big deal since they had the pitch and poster session uh, where they were supposed to entice people to come and uh, hear about their, their problem and their story. Uh, we changed a venue, and instead of me emceeing or um, my continuous improvement team, we brought two frontline employees in who were on our advisory team and participated last year and let frontline employees emcee the whole event. And because we had so many internal things going on, we did not bring in any outside speakers this year. In the past couple of years, we brought in like a lunch speaker or something like that. But this year, we had a full lineup with just this much. So that's kind of how the, the, the event the history of the event, why it's there, what it looks like. What I really want to do uh, is tell you about the teams and the types of problems that we solved. As I said, there were 22 teams this year. What you're looking here at here is the ones who won or ended up at the top uh, at the end of the day and the types of problems they were. So you've got our our finalist for our problem solving teams, you can see that, fi that final column to the right there, uh, includes the winners for second and third place and our finalist teams. And then the, the column immediately to the left of that is our culture winning teams, the teams that won the culture award. You can see the business unit, I'm working backwards, I'm sorry if you're following me backwards across the slide, the business unit affected. And then the, the four middle columns where it says safety, mobility, employee development, and innovative business practice, those are our strategic priorities. So those are the strategic areas that the teams were impacting. The team names aren't necessarily reflective of the work that they did. Some of them are creative names like the A team, um, but some of them you can kind of tell by the team names, and I'll talk about them more individually in a minute. And then I've got an event type in the very first column, and whether it was a design thinking event, a standard work event, or a new program, we had other event types as well, as I'll show you here in a minute. Um, those are the folks who got the top vote getting, um, the, the top vote getters for the day, but I, I don't ever want to mislead anybody that any of the other teams weren't as valuable or maybe had they been being judged by people who had um, a lot of lean experience or were um, looking for specific impacts, the outcomes might have been different. But this is really most of what we do at ITD is about how we're engaging our culture and the outcomes are important, but not uh, the most important outcome is how people are developing and growing and learning. So I'm going to talk about our events now. We had 22 of them, and we had two 5S events. Um, one of them was in District 2, and they came up with the theme, "If you can, you can if you will. And this was a cross-functional team, uh, even though they were focused on two maintenance sheds in Moscow and Kuski, Idaho. They comprised uh, folks from Highways, our DMV team, uh, Air Division Administration, and HR. And they believe their presentation was focused on what they got out of their 5S event, which included pride of ownership, trust building within the team, bringing that team close together. And I find it really interesting that these 5S teams really talk about the cultural impact of 5S, not just, hey, we got our workplace organized and it's easier to do stuff. Um, and so we really, really sell that hard. Uh, we're working on developing some more videos around 5S as we roll this out to the rest of the state. Two innovations came out of this 5S team. Uh, they developed a rack for the new oil system uh, that we're deploying in our sheds and a chainsaw rack. In District 5, so District 2 is our uh, north central area up in the Lewiston, Idaho uh, territory, if you're familiar with it. District 5 is eastern Idaho over along the Utah-Wyoming border. 
And they uh, came up with a theme of innovation unleashed, pride in the workplace bolstered. These themes are kind of a, a byproduct of our storytelling training, how to tell your story in six words approximately or less. Um, and this team was really amazing because it was started up by a frontline maintenance worker and he got all frontline maintenance workers from five other maintenance sheds, not one foreman, not one manager on the team. And they went around and they 5 s five sheds themselves. You can see in District 2, they did two. These are very different events in the, from in the past where um, we only did one or partial sheds in the past. So these guys were doing full sheds. Again, they're talking about workplace pride as an outcome, how they work so much better together, having the right tools for the right job on hand, and even compliments from other organizations like Monsanto. They came up with a number of innovations, candle racks, material racks, sign racks, and even standardizing the blade changing process. Uh, 5S is a big passion of mine, and I actually spend time going out to the sheds and 5Sing side by side with them. I don't think there's anything more important or better that we can do in our organization than start with 5S. So I'm super excited about these teams. Now we had three teams that worked on our new um, design thinking process. This is human-centered design thinking. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about it. If you haven't, then come to TRB. Gary and Nathan from Utah and myself will be um, featuring uh, design thinking at a TRB panel, and we'll be bringing along a group of high school kids to talk about how they used it to develop the Clutch app. But my three teams in ITD this year, they worked on three areas. Uh, one, innovate ITD employee recognition. Um, and this was actually born out of a meetup we did with the Utah DOT um, last January, and we were identifying uh, things that we could do to improve our innovation efforts. And what you see there in the picture is some of the prototypes um, that they developed in that event. We also have our Shift Engage Driving campaign. And this is a partnership between Idaho Power and ITD as we start to um, work on our cultural norms around uh, safe driving behaviors. And this is a campaign that they're focused on changing the conversation from talking about the negative aspects of distracted driving to the positive aspects of engaged driving. And so this team was uh, looking at how can we design a toolbox for essentially an employer consortium to advance the shift campaign. Then we had another team that was a follow-up from last year around employee safety recognition, and they designed and developed a, a coin, uh, uh, it's modeled after the military coins um, to promote safe behavior among employees. We had five events that were focused on employees. Uh, one of them was a career planning toolbox. One of them was uh, called Python eBug. E and the bottom one on the right there was equipment operator training. All three of these teams were focused on developing and training employees specifically for their career or advancing them through some sort of career funnel. The other two, uh, well, DMV employee recognition was um, having to replace an outdated and non-compliant recognition uh, uh, program. And they took some learnings out of Plexus that we went and visited and benchmarked with, as well as incorporating a number of things that they learned uh, just from benchmarking with other folks inside ITD. And then there was Your Safety PP&E, and this was a large effort that went on throughout the year about converting all of our personal protective equipment in, uh, into more visible uh, recognizable gear that would be shared amongst all the employees in all divisions and rolling that program out. 
Uh, two events reached outside of ITD. One of them was with our transit department. We have a lot of local agencies that are trying to figure out how to buy buses, and right now they're prohibited from accessing the state procurement system. It makes them particularly challenged in being able to pool funds or access and leverage the buying power of the state. So the Procurement Pros team worked on that program. And then we had a team that did snowplow safety educational outreach. And this was about taking a really old, old dated program about teaching about snowplow safety in the schools, elementary, junior high, and high schools. And so they developed a whole uh, new education program to deploy to those schools. We had three standard work events in the administrative arena. The A team was about uh, centralizing administrative services that had been uh, dispersed into the highways headquarters uh, organization. And if I'm not mistaken, that, that reduced approximately 10 FTEs worth of work. Um, so that was a really huge outcome for them. We have the Mauser team, which was a really fun team in a, a, a round two from a team last year about how we manage our MOUs and MOAs, our memorandums of understanding and memorandums of agreement throughout the state. And then the future of forms management, which interestingly enough was a decentralization pro project where they actually gave back ownership of forms to form owners instead of having centralized control which ended up adding a whole bunch of administrative process time. So they eliminated a ton of waste. Two other standard work events that we're really thinking about the future, uh, although I like to say the future is now, it's already here. One was the um, UAS committee, which is thinking that we've got a lot of different parts of our organizations that are trying to use um, drones essentially in all sorts of different parts of the business, whether it be in the communications, the bridge, the inspection, uh, aeronautics. And so what are those standard policies, processes that we need to get in place to be able to effectively um, utilize this technology of the future? And then we have demystifying PII. Uh, some of you may realize ITD had a cyber breach last year. It was a small one, but nonetheless, there's no small breach in my mind. And this had to do with personally identifiable information. And a big piece of our work needs to be around educating everybody, the world, but specifically our employees on what PII is and the proper way to handle it. And so this team has taken on that task. We had three highways construction standard work events. Uh, the construction payout team, which was about how do we get the money paid out the door and just not the projects teed up and queued in the system. We were growing a very large cash balance by not getting those dollars paid out. And this team did a phenomenal job at turning that around and getting us ahead of the curve. Our TREDIS team is about how we evaluate our construction projects and select them for economic impact. And then our double wide do dozen team was about consultant performance evaluation and the importance of closing out consultant agreements. Standard work events in our highways maintenance team, we had Team Clean that was working on how we get those trucks washed out there, especially in the winter, to prevent the rusting, especially as we use more salt and mag chloride and move away from the sand. Um, it's creating a lot of corrosion on our vehicles, and this was a team of maintenance folks that got together and recognized we need to figure out how to do this uh, so that the teams can, can uh, protect our equipment. And then my team, uh, personally, the, uh, the one that I was uh, the champion of is the District 5 Equipment Assessment Team. And their real focus was how do we give frontline employees a voice in impacting the decisions of what kind of equipment they're going to use on the job. So these guys had gone out and they selected snow plow blades as their first um, effort. And they wanted to test the blades to see which ones worked the best and were the most effective for the work that was to be done. And we developed a model that other employees could use to get involved with the same thing across the state. And so this is a really fun project for me and I believe it will deliver a lot of returns in the future. Okay, that was all 22 of the teams and I just gave you a whole bunch of stuff really fast. But what the other thing I wanna talk about is the summit itself 
when we're done with the summit, aside from all of this fantastic work that the teams do, we then evaluate the summit and we say we had four objectives with the summit. How did we do it meeting our objectives? So you might remember that first slide I threw up there. Um, the first objective is, is for us to develop folks. Then the other objective is for them to be able to collaborate learn something new, and then achieve measurable results. And so we ask everybody, did we exceed your expectations, meet or not meet your expectations? And this was their response. And so you can see we have a whole lot of folks that we exceeded expectations, very few that we did not meet expectations. And then I compare it to uh, year over year, as well as against the objectives, like were you satisfied with the event? Were you unsatisfied or more than satisfied? You can see that we had a, a, a little bit of a jump in unsatisfied folks. Those are, uh, since there was about 100 responses, that works into about 10, even though we had about 150, that's, that's about average for our response rate. The majority of the unsatisfied um, responses had to do with the fact that the folks who did not make the final eight, uh, they were unhappy that they put all the work into building a presentation and they didn't get to present it. Um, the other factor of dissatisfaction is people really, really like it when they get put on a new team and get to work with somebody new. So for all the folks who just came in and worked on the same teams they'd been working with all year, they didn't find it quite as interesting as in the past years. So as usual, we have debriefed with all the teams. We've got a long list and we take this back to our senior leadership team. And every January we say, how did we do? Do we wanna do this again? What do we wanna change if we do wanna do it again? And we start up with the new year with making improvements. And that is a whole lot really fast. I apologize for racing through it, but I really wanted to tell you about all of the really great work the teams did. I'm really excited about this year's event. So for that, I will stand for any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Char, for that. Um, that was great. Uh, if anyone has any questions, just a reminder, you can submit them through the um, Zoom group chat. Um, or you can just unmute yourself. I have a, <clears throat> I have a quick question. Shari, this is Geneva Hooten with CDOT. Uh, we have leadership fora, forums here at CDOT. They happen in the, at the beginning of the summer, and it's just for managers and supervisors. And the format is very, very different from how you all have done it. Um, and sorry if I missed this, but is, are all staff uh, invited to come, or how do you select who gets to come to this leadership forum summit? So this year it was problem teams, it was teams. So the teams okay. had to apply and already been formed. And then of course, well in the past it was individual applications. So they applied and then what we did is we kind of give a quota, we gave a quota to each senior leader and they had to go through the list. And because we only take about 150 people okay. and we don't ever want somebody who's maybe, you know, working on performance challenges or not the right fit. So seniorly, and we also don't want like to shut down a whole business unit if the whole business unit comes. So we've got to balance it a little bit. Um, but yeah, so senior leaders get involved with making sure that the right people are coming. And it is not just leadership. It can be, as I mentioned, it can be frontline or it can be leaders and managers. But uh, we find the best thing is to have a nice mix. That's great. Thank you so much. And I think that answered one of the questions from the chat. Um, but we have another one asking what the prize was for the winners, um, if there was a prize. Yeah, so um, we have a, a, a wonderful metal artist in one of our districts. He's in our training and development department out there. And he made these really cool, in fact, look, I have one. Um, these really cool trophies, can, if you can see my video, uh, and this is, you know, it looks like a little Oscar, right? Um, but it has our ITD logo, and he does this on a CNC machine, and this is, uh, it's not iron, uh, it's, 
I don't know what this metal is, but it's very heavy. Um, and so each person got one of these little guys for uh, if they were on the winning team. Awesome. Hey, Shara, this is Gary. As usual, a, a terrific presentation. I had the <clears throat> great pleasure to hear one of your colleagues from ITD speak uh, uh, in Iowa at the uh, recent uh, Ashto Innovations Conference. And he flashed up a number, uh, a, a very large number, in terms of the number of folks that uh, you've had engaged in your you know, Innovate ITD effort. Uh, I know it's voluntary, uh, but if I remember correctly, it was, it was a very large number. Do you have that, an update on that number? Um, you know, we measure that annually. So I think that that rides between 40 and 50% um, of employees who've somehow been involved in Innovate ITD, which is where employees submit ideas um, to make improvements. Uh, so it could be either they submitted an idea or implemented an innovation. And although we'd like that number bigger, um, it's, it's, it's still a phenomenal number when you think about how it's just grown really quickly in just a couple of years. Thanks, Char, and congratulations on your success there uh, in, uh, in Idaho. Thanks, Gary. All right, well, if we have no further questions, um, we can move on to uh, Mike Hopkins. But I did want to say, if you if you think of some more questions later on, we uh, will be able to answer those in the open forum later. So, Mike, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and uh, request um, control. All right, you should have control. All right. There we go. Uh, Char, great presentation. I, uh, I'm a little jealous because I kind of want one of those trophies. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Gary and uh, his team in Colorado for the uh, invitation. Uh, I am Michael Hopkins. I am the process improvement specialist and uh, office head for the Office of Performance-Based Management and Research. Uh, we call ourselves OPMR, uh, uh, out of GDOT, so Georgia Department of Transportation. Um, my background is in process improvement, um, so for the last 13, 14 years, I, I've, I've uh, identified opportunities and business improvement initiatives um, around eliminating waste and facilitating measurable and sustainable improvement in uh, business processes. So. I'm uh, new to the D, uh, DOT setting. Uh, I'm learning a lot in these, uh, these past 15 months, uh, but I'm, I'm very uh, happy for the, uh, the opportunity to lead uh, the Office of Performance-Based Management and Research. So to quickly summarize what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about the mission and overarching goals of uh, the Office of Performance-Based Management and Research. I'll call us OPMR going forward. Um, we'll also talk about how the office is organized, and we'll talk about the, um, the four programs within uh, OPMR. So that's, uh, we've, we've got a performance uh, management program, a strategic management program that you know really works hand in hand with that. Um, uh, we're in charge of coordinating asset management activities and improving asset the asset management function, as well as uh, we manage the research activities uh, here at GDOT. And at the end of the day, uh, of course, you know, uh, spoiler alert: it's it's all about uh, uh, continuous improvement, right? So let me let me let me start with the mission of uh, OPMR. Um, our, our focus is to work uh, collaboratively with uh, and cross-functionally across GDOT to support uh, and help facilitate a culture of continuous improvement. Um, our goal is to uh, 
promote performance-based management and the use of research to drive um, efficiency and innovation. Um, we're, we're, we're an advocate for continuous improvement. Um, I talked earlier about our four uh, strategic units, and I'll get a little bit more in depth about what each of those functions do in just a second. So this is my organizational structure. So we have uh, uh, a team of two managers that uh, report to me that oversee about uh, 10 resources across our four programs. I've uh, got a couple of open positions that we will talk a little bit more about some of the challenges that I'm facing, one of which being um, finding folks that have the have a good mix of uh, uh, process improvement knowledge, experience, and buy-in, which is very important, uh, with uh, DOT experience, right? I, I find folks that have, uh, they're really strong in one or the other. It's very challenging to find folks that uh, uh, have both. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move forward. So um, what most people here know us for, and this is this is probably one of the, the highest visibility initiatives we have, and one of the initiatives that I'm, I'm most proud of is um, our commissioner, Russell McMurray, is, is a, a, a strong advocate for uh, utilizing data uh, to drive performance. Um, so I, I can't take full credit for it. Uh, before I joined the organization, he introduced um, quarterly performance reviews, where we bring each of the each division, every office, every district. Uh, we all come together to take a look at our performance and identify ways that we can. Uh, well, to see how we're doing, number one, and, 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 and have a collaborative discussion around ways that we uh, uh, can improve. So a lot of focus since I've joined has been in making, um, uh, collecting the data faster, because my team actually collects the data from each of the offices, and we, we make it visual, you know, so we have our, we have our uh, Pareto charts, um, or our bar charts, uh, we, we color code them to try to make things easier to, as far as identifying uh, when you miss a target or when you achieve a target, uh, we identify where the targets uh, are, um, um, and we have a collaborative discussion. Um, and one of the things I found is that by bringing folks together, you have folks that don't normally get together to talk continuous improvement. Um, they're very happy to actually have those have those discussions. And out of those conversations come um, cross-functional work groups that my team um, facilitates to help solve problems and improve uh, uh, performance across the agency. All right, so um, it, we, we also have our own performance metrics. Um, <laughs> OPMR, uh, among other things, uh, we, we, for each of my programs, we, we have performance metrics um, we, around timeliness uh, of delivery of our work products, uh, around the quality of our work products. Um, we also maintain uh, the external dashboard. Um, if you were to go out to our, um, our website and, and look for it, you're going to find that it's, it's, it's down, it's, it's under construction because we're, we're, re we're currently revising it, right? Um, we, are, we, are, we also uh, contribute the metrics that we share in a lot of our internal and external publications, a picture which is uh, to the right of your screen here. Um, and we uh, deliver external reporting to uh, federal highways as well as uh, the governor's office of planning and budget to let them know how we are performing. So all in all, there's about 250 performance measures that pass through my office and we are the gatekeepers to make sure that uh, that data is accurate, uh, it's uh, repeatable. Uh, if there is a 
question. We, we're, 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 we're asking questions. Um, if there's an opportunity, we're, we're, we're seeing where we can actually fit in to actually help uh, improve performance. And so another aspect of what we do is training, right? And so uh, before I joined the organization, at the beginning of the um, introduction of um, bringing folks together to review their performance, the performance measure reviews that I talked about earlier, um, we developed some training called uh, performance management in you. And basically that was a uh, almost an infomercial and an education piece to uh, let folks know why it's important to uh, collect performance measures and what the benefit is uh, to the organization. Uh, after I joined, I, I realized that there was a need to uh, take uh, that training to the next level. And so we went from performance management in you to process improvement in you, which was about, okay, now you collect performance measures, you understand how your um, your offices or your districts are performing. Now what? And, and so basically, uh, the process improvement in you training is more of a um, primer course or introductory course to uh, the Lean and Six Sigma methodology. And also uh, a bit of a uh, commercial for my, for my office to let folks know that uh, we're available to uh, assist them and help them with their projects that they're not they're not alone on this process of human journey. All right, so there is uh, the strategic management program, right? Where we, we talked about the submission of uh, the strategic plan to the Office of Performance. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Governor's Office of Planning. And budget. We've been doing that for about 14 years, and so we 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 uh, deliver this report, and um, I'm sorry, we deliver this report, and we provide annual progress reports to show uh, uh, the governor's office how we're how we're performing. Um, surveys is a line of business that has really really grown for us. Um, we actually uh, facilitate the biannual uh, GDOT employee survey. And once folks started realizing our capabilities with that, we, I, I've noticed a dramatic uptick in offices that want to arrange um, regular or ad hoc surveys. Um, so to, to kind of highlight you know, where, how they're improving. Um, and so we actually put these surveys together um, and we help them uh, uh, analyze the results through formal reports. Um, and that's been a, 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 um, a growing line of business for us. I talked about one of the, uh, uh, talked about the asset management program. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is, you know, we're, we're responsible for ensuring the delivery of the um, uh, federally required transportation asset management plan, as well as um, taking a look at the uh, processes behind uh, asset management to make sure that we do a good job tying people, processes, and technology together and ensuring that our processes are uh, data driven uh, to actually augment sound engineering uh, judgment, right? The, the whole goal here is to move us away from that that whole worst first uh, methodology uh, to a, a more methodical approach to measuring risk um, and you know, managing our assets. And of course, uh, we want to ensure that there is uh, better transparency and accountability for state resources. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that, you know, we, you know, with the federal requirement, we, we didn't have to find ourselves starting from scratch. Um, 
I, I, I learned after joining an organization that we were one of the, uh, the first DOTs to actually uh, produce uh, a, a plan. Uh, we are on our uh, fourth iteration of an asset management plan. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it's all about ensuring that we have uh, appropriate tools in place to, to promote transparency and accountability. Research. So I, 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 I uh, manage a, 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 the research program as well. And the OPMR uh, research program develops and manages um, and implements uh, strategic research across the organization. Um, we're not in the business of just performing basic research, which is, you know, uh, research uh, knowledge, acquiring knowledge for knowledge's sake. Um, we're really into applied research. Um, our, our program is the eighth largest in the country. Um, and uh, we have performance metrics for our research program as well. And so as we seek to uh, uh, solve problems or answer questions across our offices and our districts, um, we've placed a, a huge emphasis on implementation, right? We wanna make sure that we're using our research dollars wisely. And so we begin with the end in mind. And we're, we're at the outset of any uh, research project, we're trying to, we're asking ourselves, what do we plan on uh, achieving? And we set implementation goals. And as a performance metric for OPMR, we measure the, uh, 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 the rate of implementation, right? So we can be, uh, we can ensure that we are um, selecting the right research project. <laughs> we can ensure that um, the projects and the dollars that we're spending uh, provide a measurable benefit to, to GDOT. And a lot of this I've, I've actually covered, but uh, one of the ways we do this is uh, we, we actually have um, what we call RTAGs or research technical advisory groups that meet twice a year um, to ensure that the most effective uh, identification of research needs uh, and research projects is taking place. And we have, uh, we divide the RTAGs into uh, four subgroups. And so we have groups that meet to talk about asset management and they develop research needs statements regarding that. Uh, we have groups that meet regarding mobility, um, policy and workforce, as well as safety. Um, and these groups get together and they deliberate and they think of uh, what type of projects or what type of questions do we have that, that need an answer. Um, and that's, one of our, that's part of our vetting process. Another thing we do is uh, I talked about the focus on implementation, right? And so we have a documented implementation plan for each research project, as well as milestones. And we actually, um, we work with uh, what we call the technical implementation managers in the uh, sponsoring office uh, to ensure actual implementation. We also maintain a, uh, a library the GDOT library, and so that, that includes uh, 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 referring folks to uh, physical and online periodicals or uh, uh, past research um, to help bolster, I guess, education or uh, awareness or knowledge or the knowledge base of our uh, resources here. So one of the places where, or, or, or one, the next phase of OPMR's work is to dive a, a bit deeper into the realm of process improvement, right? And so uh, I'm, I'm actually on tour right now, going to each of our districts to, to have one-on-one -on -one talks with uh, the leadership just to identify uh, opportunities to streamline their processes uh, and eliminate waste, right? Um, 
and, and, and share, you know, a, a bit of a primer on um, lean and waste el uh, elimination and Six Sigma and, and uh, defect reduction, right? And it also gives me a, a good opportunity to see what folks are doing out in the field and let folks know that I'm not just uh, some guy sitting in a general office um, asking them to, you know, come on down and, and talk about their performance. Um, uh, it shows that I'm, I'm, I'm right there with them and, and, and it boosts my education as well uh, regarding the things that the uh, folks are doing on the ground. And so some of the things that I'm sharing with folks in these meetings is that, um, as we are having uh, these process-driven conversations quarterly, it, it's, it's really a great template for them to perform um, with their folks as well. So having many performance measure reviews and brainstorming solutions, um, it really sends the message that uh, GDOT is really about driving continuous improvement. And it makes sure that um, if there are answers the problems within your organization that you're giving folks an opportunity to actually uh, communicate that. Um, of course, we're always um, looking for ways to uh, find a redundant activity, non-value added opportunity. And uh, one of the things I'm always telling folks, uh, just having a conversation, I think is really important. Uh, if you don't have time to do it right, um, when are you going to have time to do it again, right? I find that people always, uh, in many cases, really identify with that because we're all stretched for time. And, and part of my goal is to let people know that Six Sigma isn't just about adding uh, or isn't about adding additional administrative processes or layers to your process. It's really about helping you drive efficiency and get rid of that non-value added work, uh, help, helping improve the chances that you do things right the first time, because as we're all stretched for time, none of us really want to have to do it all over again. Um, and of course, we're moving into documenting our core processes, um, just as a uh, uh, protection against uh, folks moving into different areas of the organization um, or leaving the organization and producing knowledge gaps. Um, we're, begin we're in the beginning phases of documenting uh, the processes for those um, high-risk business processes. And lastly, you know, some of the challenges that we're working through is these are very um, highly specialized positions. And uh, like I said, sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to find folks that are indoctrinated <laughs> in the, the the world of process improvement, you know, not everybody always believes um, um, that we should be looking for new and innovative approaches to doing things. Uh, some people are very much married to the old ways of doing things, and you want to make sure that you have people uh, uh, on your team, or making sure I have people on my team that not only uh, talk the talk but walk the walk, because we want to be the example for the organization. Right. And, and, and it requires that we have a broad range of proficiency. So um, uh, whether it's in continuous improvement, whether it's in uh, business analysis. Um, I always uh, one of the things I've learned is, you know, some of us can build a nice chart, but do we know what it actually tells us? Right. Um, that's that's very important. And of course, we talked about, you know, uh, the time it takes to uh, onboard folks, because you know, if someone's strong in DOT knowledge, uh, bringing them up to speed, of, you know, regarding the analytical skills or the uh, continuous improvement uh, uh, abilities, uh, and then there's you know the other side of the coin where folks have those strong analytical skills, um, uh, but it's going to take considerable time when you bring somebody on. Uh, if they don't have knowledge of uh, DOT operations to get them up to speed, right? So with that, I'm uh, open to uh, any uh, questions that you guys may have for me.
Yeah, thank you for that, Mike. That was great. Um, so yeah, just another reminder, you can always uh, submit questions through the chat pane. I did um, have a question actually for you, Mike. Um, how are you measuring the success and like sustainability of the improvements? I know you mentioned there's a focus on implementation planning and reducing rework, but do you, do you have like um, a way of recording that? Right, so we, we are introducing control plans Right, and nothing really elaborate, um, but um, for every change that we make, um, we, we, we're documenting uh, how we're going to measure uh, success. Um, so, in, in many cases, especially with the research that we're doing, um, at the very beginning, before the projects get greenlit, part of the um, part of the research needs statement is actually documenting what success looks like. Um, and we create implementation goals. And at um, various spots within the course of the project, as well as after the project, um, we're making sure that we do our due diligence to actually go back and check against those goals. Because uh, one of the things I'm always uh, telling folks is, um, a, lot, a lot of where folks um, <clears throat> fail with uh, process improvement is in the beginning and planning and identifying um, what you're trying to achieve and at the end making sure that you sustain that achievement and you've actually done what you said you were going to do, right? So uh, for us, it's really about documenting that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Any My other questions? Could you talk more about change communication planning? Right. Yeah. So um, that's something we're working on as as well. So you know, in the past, we haven't always done uh, the best job at communicating um, changes that were coming, and as part of that, um, we've struggled to get folks to accept the changes because it was kind of sprung on them. So um, part of that beginning for us is developing our change communication plan. And we're also, um, uh, a lot of us went through uh, GDOT uh, management development training. And uh, one of the things that we learned is that, um, and this was, a, this was a big game changer for me, uh, we learned that folks don't, um, folks aren't on or off when it comes to buy-in, that there is kind of like a graduated scale of acceptance. <laughs> and so you'll find that uh, certain folks um, have uh, within a group or depart, uh, an, an office may have various levels of acceptance. And so we kind of try to cater to that knowing that. Um, but part of what we do to mitigate the risk that folks don't uh, accept a change or accept a new process is by making sure that we communicate early on about what we're trying to do and that they see at the level that's appropriate for them that um, that there is a methodical plan and uh, uh, basically keeping them in the loop uh, with the plan of course we have a master documented change plan um, and when we get ready to roll out we work we work that plan. But the, the big piece that's very important is letting folks know that the change is actually coming and what the value is to them. Great, thank you. All right. Do we have any other questions? Anyone who want to unmute themselves or anything? All right, then I think we're gonna move on to our next presenter, Geneva. And so she's actually just sitting right here. So she's going to go ahead and take control in person of the screen. All right. Thank you, Shay. So 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Geneva Hutton. and I lead innovation and improvement here at CDOT. And my background is in transportation. I worked as a transportation planner before coming to CDOT. And I had heard of the Everyday Counts program, which is the Federal Highway Administration's innovation and improvement deployment. And it's something that I had learned about and knew of several EDC innovations, as they're called. And then when I came to CDOT, I, I really got to know this program better. And so what is it? Everyday Counts is the state-based model that identifies uh, improvements across the US that should be deployed quickly. Uh, and these innovations are things that will either shorten the project delivery process, enhance roadway safety, and that means for all road users, pedestrians, bicyclists, drivers, transit users, reducing vehicular traffic congestion, and improving environmental sustainability. So it's a very, very broad uh, qualification statement for anything that can count as an innovation. And what the Federal Highway Administration does is every two years they go through a new set of innovations and they have a call for innovations across the U.S. That's the, uh, <laughs> the American flag, U.S. Uh, and they, they say, what are you working on? What's working really well? What are you seeing that should, that other state DOTs would really benefit from? All of these in innovations go to FHWA for vetting, and then they choose 10 innovations that will comprise the next round of the EDC innovations. We are now on the fifth round, EDC5. Uh, this has been around for 10 years. They choose those 10 innovations, bring folks from state DOTs together to regional summits, bringing roughly 10 people from different DOTs, some local agency partners, but mostly staff from um, the departments themselves, two regional summits to say, here's what's going on, here's what you can learn from them. And then over the next two years, following up with, with uh, staff in DOTs to say, how is this working? How can we help you? What do you need? What kind of knowledge can we share to make this more effective? And then uh, after the, those two years, then it starts in the, the next round. So we are sitting right now, December 2018, the very next round of EDC innovations kicks off January 1st, and then it will be measured over the, the next two years, ending December of 2020. So here's the kind of innovations that we're talking about. This is everything from drones or UASs, uh, project bundling, value capture, virtual public involvement, things that have been around for quite a long time. And what's, what's interesting about this to me is that these are not always high high tech flashy innovations. These have been around for a little while. The safe, safe transportation for every pedestrian, the, the acronym is STEP, it's kind of QC. It, one of the things that they're pushing is the um, rectangular rapid flash beacons, which is a pedestrian safety countermeasure. These have been around, it's something that's underutilized and is supported. <coughs> it's not always an actual technological innovation either. Project bundling is something uh, that some, some states are doing quite well, others like CDOT we're, we're on our way to doing more of, and this is an improvement that will help with project delivery and cost savings and is not as well used. So how they're doing it, these regional summits, and I was lucky enough to go to the regional summit in Portland, Oregon back in November, and that was with about 150 different transportation professionals from around most of the Western states, but there were 23 states represented. These are idea exchanges to learn about those 10 innovations. And then you, um, at the beginning, there's this very short pitch from the various subject matter experts. They have songs and it's, it's very interactive. Of, this is why this is cool. You should come learn about it. And then there are three different breakout sessions where you can go in for two hours learn about a specific case study, ask questions, connect with subject matter experts. And then um, those sessions are, are e extremely um, effective because Federal Highway Administration is saying, how can we help you, state DOTs, in advancing these? So you can see in that photo, uh, proposed efforts, peer exchanges, webinars, UAS training programs, regional workshops. And this was, this was interactive, that was folks saying, hey, well, how can we help you? What will be most valuable? There were surveys after these. And then they'll take that information back to the various division offices and headquarters there for Federal Highway Administration and use that information to make sure that they are most helpful to DOTs. So that those support and resources to adopt the innovations, that's really what they're getting at. 
And what's interesting about the regional summits is it follows the ADCAR model of change management, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. So they're bringing people together and saying, Here, here's awareness about innovations. Maybe you are aware that project bundling exists, maybe you're not. Here's why it's valuable, that's getting to the desire. Knowledge about how to use them. Ability, really saying, here are the folks if you have questions or if you need more specific guidance or if you have very technical questions about how to deploy drones or surveying, all of those sorts of things, that's getting to ability. And then the reinforcement is happening over the next two years, checking in, following up. I'm one of the EDC coordinators for CDOT, and so that's that's partially my job along with Federal Highway Administration staff to be following up with our um, with our CDOT representatives. <clears throat> and at the end, we have a caucus, which you know is not just for primary elections. And this was a I actually found this very fun. We all sat together around a table and went through all ten of the innovations and said, "Is this something that we want to advance at CDOT?" And we chose our level of a deployment existing. Either we're not using it at all, we're in some development stages, we're demonstrating it, or it's going all the way to institutionalize. And we chose nine of the 10 to advance here at CDOT. And then we're saying by December 2020, so at the end of this next uh, cycle for EDC, where do we expect to be? We would like to be farther, so if we're at development, we'd like to get to demonstration or assessment. And eventually to get to an institutionalized level for each of the innovations. And here's what people are saying about it. Jamie is our Avalanche program manager and he says this is, it was fun, it was collaborative, it was educational. And from all of the CDOT staff who went, every single person said roughly that this was a an educational and very helpful way to be learning about some of the technological advances and other innovations that we'd like to be using. And most importantly, people talked about the value of having some of that peer-to-peer -peer education. We had a fabulous presenter from the Utah Department of Transportation who has been deploying UAS technology. He's doing great work. His, his uh, presentation was so helpful and everyone came together to say, you know, this is exactly the kind of information that we need to help advance it at, at CDOT. And why this matters and how this connects to lean is that Federal Highway Administration is a massive organization. They have tons and tons of money, they have tons of people, it's a, it's a big organization, and they are trying to support continuous improvement and innovation, and they're doing it through this program. And what's interesting is they're really leveraging the existing state DOT structures. They're, they're supporting DOTs as much as they can, supporting staff, adding, adding to um, existing knowledge and um, processes that exist. And they're doing it through a pretty structured approach and using some of those principles of change management through ADCAR to say, here's what we would like to see move forward and here's how we can help you do that. And that, that concludes my Everyday Counts Overview, just a real quick hitter. Awesome, well thank you. Thank you everyone. That was so great. So we are actually gonna kind of move along into um, the, the closing and any um, questions uh, for the open forum can be added to questions for Geneva as well. So please, anyone, um, if you want to unmute yourself or use the chat, um, this is a time for you to share your successes and also ask additional questions or discuss topics that we haven't addressed in this webinar. <clears throat> I have a question for Michael. Um, you talked about some of the training that you are rolling out in terms of, um, I think it was process improvement and you training, kind of a basic introduction to that process improvement. And I was just wondering what kind of tools are presented in that um, training that you have found or maybe your quick wins that people are actually taking back to their workplaces and using to, to, um, to improve processes? Right, right. So um, I, I, I kind of go really light so I don't um, bombard people with, with tools and I, I have a lot of anecdotal stories. I do kind of take you through the um, Six Sigma, the MAIC, 
process, right, around, you know, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, um, and some things they should be doing at each step, um, like uh, uh, project plans um, to make sure that uh, you, you've thought through what you're trying to do, um, and this is the place where you, you, you really start thinking about the, uh, you begin with the end of mind, um, so you're, you know, making sure that you, uh, I'm sorry, I said project plans, I meant project charters, right? Um, so that you're making sure that um, <clears throat> you know who your team is and your folks on the team know that they're part of the team. Uh, you're all on the same page, your team and your, your leadership with what you're trying to achieve and what that achieve, achievement or achievements will look like. Um, and and, and uh, we talk a little bit about uh, collecting data, <clears throat> maybe using Excel to kind of chart that data. Uh, we, we talk about, um, you know, analyzing that data. Uh, we, we, we talk about process mapping and um, uh, doing current state and future state. Um, we do talk a little bit about value stream mapping um, uh, for situations where you might want to improve the time to perform a particular task. Um, I do talk about the importance of process mapping um, and the fact that in my experience, I found that most of us think a process works a certain way. Uh, but if you discuss that process with different people, especially if it's uh, that process crosses various uh, functional groups, that that process a lot of times looks very different depending on where you sit in the organization and where you sit um, uh, in the performance of that uh, that particular process, and then I do uh, I do uh, stress the importance of control plans to make sure that you have a way of ensuring that those changes that you've made stay in place. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I think. Um... Um, certainly the content is really interesting. Um, are you, do you have a way of kind of tracking what um, the, which participants are um, applying those tools and um, um, actually what, actually, I guess, using that content? Yeah, N no, not really. Um... No, not really. Um, I, I, what I find is that you'll have certain people that really gravitate <laughs> mm -hmm. to the concept. Um, and what, what will happen in, in those cases is they either uh, ask you to share templates, because I do have templates. Um, they'll ask you to share the template or um, uh, the, the, the help them work through how to utilize the template. Um, or sometimes there's a, uh, they may just actually invite you for a maybe a process mapping session or to kind of help facilitate the process improvement itself. So that's typically the experience that I've, uh, I've experienced. Um, but no, we don't necessarily track who's using what tools. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that that can be a challenge with training in general, really understanding the impact of it. And I like how you had mentioned that um, you kind of use that training almost as um, a way to promote what your office does and the services that you can provide as well. Um, I would open it to the community in general and maybe Shar, you have some thoughts on this as well. Um, if you are doing process improvement training um, what do you think? What do you think is the biggest bang for your buck, and how are you, how are you seeing that and tracking it? Um, I uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So uh, the uh, I think we don't approach uh, continuous improvement clear to the extent of Six Sigma here. I'm I'm still focusing on the basics in the organization. Um, our our culture training includes um, cha training on ad car and change communication. So in the continuous improvement arena where we take things is some of the basic fundamentals that includes an eight waste training, 
um, which especially in the administration area, people find extremely enlightening. In fact, it surprises me sometimes how I, I've had people who tell me it was like life changing for them to think about things differently uh, when it comes to teaching them what the waste are and looking for those wastes and how many of them they can eliminate on their own without doing any process improvement event. Um, 5S training, I mentioned that in the summit. You know, that's essentially the foundation of everything. If you have not uh, got your workplace organized and made it safe and given people access to the tools they need to do the work and standardized it and sustained that, I challenge people as to why they're doing anything else, because if you don't put the foundation and the baseline in place, it, then then it's really hard to go on and do some of the advanced stuff. Um, but then, you know, you can get into some of the specific tools with any of the, the programs. You know, when we first rolled out um, Lean Inside Continuous Improvement, and our organization has chosen to use plain talk instead of the specific uh, language around some of the tools, we, we talked about deploying training across the state. And that was my first plan. Hey, I want to get everybody trained in all the different uh, continuous improvement tools. But what we've learned is it doesn't do any good to train people in things if they're not going to use it. So we changed our approach and we've decided to only train people when they're doing an event. So if you're doing a standard work event, well, whoever's doing it, we're going to train you on the tools you need to do that event at that time because you're going to apply them right then and there. We felt it would be a bit of a wasted effort to go around and try to train the whole organization. You know, ideally someday I'd like to say we have 100% of our folks trained in lean, but like with 5S, as that's taking on this organic growth and snowballing, they're getting the training as they're actually doing it and we're picking it up that way. It also helps us level load the, the load on the training aspect. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I like that approach, thank you. Hey, this is Mike. Can I add something too? Um, yeah, I I I, uh, I I agree. The um, one of the uh, topics that I find people really gravitate to is the concept of the uh, uh, the forms of waste, right? Because it, it gives folks an opportunity to talk about how uh, each of those forms applies to um, uh, their neck of the woods. So you can have a cross-functional group, and they they can they can just kind of chime off uh, um, uh, situations where you know uh, they've experienced that, and I think it helps really um, get uh, buy-in because it it helps folks see that this is real stuff. It's not just academic, you know. Uh, so sure, I, I agree with you there. Um, yeah, it makes it touchable or approachable, right? They can actually relate to it. Right, right, and 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 and, and buy-in is really important. And I've done, um, I guess, every time I start with a new organization, there is always kind of like this big push to train, 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 train. And buy-in is very important. Um, just because you train folks, the you, not everybody's going to be a believer, right? Because I, I find that continuous improvement is kind of like. Uh, uh, eating your vegetables <laughs> or your gym membership is really good, but you know, it's some people kind of feel it's, uh, it's optional and, 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 and it sometimes, uh, uh, requires a change in your, your thinking and your approach, uh, uh or the approach that is, you know, in many cases most comfortable to people. So, uh, I, I have found though, um, just the training itself does create sometimes awareness uh, not just necessarily believers, but it creates awareness around the work that you do and the work that the organization is is, is doing around continuous improvement. And that in itself um, brings believers, whether they become practitioners, as I've seen, um, or whether it's just somebody that when you come around uh, to be helpful, they're, they're actually more receptive just because they've actually heard your message. Would anyone else in the forum like to jump in on that one? All right. 
Um, I know Gary had a little announcement, a little call out he wanted to. Well, if there are more things, yeah. uh, please feel free to, uh, you know, to, to bring up topics. Uh, but I do, and I, I don't know, you have to tell me whether this is showing. Uh, one of the folks that has been on our forum before, a little closer, a little closer uh, Kate McGovern, uh, actually has a great, uh, uh, I just got this book 10 minutes ago, I, I, uh, just coming through, it looks great. Uh, it says, A Public Sector Journey to Lean. It actually is it, um, uh, talking about the public sector journey in New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire. She's also done some work with VTrans, uh, uh, Vermont Transportation uh, Agency for Transportation. Uh, really terrific that uh, somebody who's been on the forum before has a book out there. I'm looking forward to uh, reading it and, and a shout out to anybody on the on the uh, teleconference from New Hampshire. Uh, it looks like terrific work being um, documented in that book. It looks like we may have some other stuff coming in through the chat pane. Um, lots of people saying great presentations today. So for the presenters, good job there. Um, but no, no more uh, questions or topics for discussion there. So. Well, a happy holidays, CDOT team, and thanks again for all of your work to support uh, and manage this forum. We really appreciate all of you. I know it takes a team effort. Yeah, no, you're sure. Thank you, Mike, for, for your participation in your um, presentations today. And I know Quentin wanted to make a quick announcement about the um, next TLF. Um, yeah, so even though we just finished this TLF, we're already thinking about February's. Um, so um, I guess, hi, I'm Quentin. I will be running the next uh, TLF in February, probably around the third week um, in that month. And so Gary and I were talking about doing something a little bit different where we're asking uh, more presenters to showcase the innovations that your DOT does. We know that they're out there. Um, I know CDOT has a couple of great post pollers that they love talking about. Um, so we're, just, we're asking for about seven to 10 minute presentations from about five to six different DOTs showcasing um, an innovation I know in October that Arizona DOT had their um, lane striping innovation and that's kind of what sparked this idea. So um, if you'd like to be on, if you'd like to sh show off uh, your innovations, shoot me an email, um, it's up there, or you can go to that link down there. Oh, my email's wrong? Uh, oh, no. It's <laughs> quinton.boost at state.co.us. <laughs> um, or you can just go to the link um, that's down there. Um, and if nobody nobody wants to participate, we will come find you. We know, that, <laughs> we know that they're out there on social media. We see them everywhere. So this is kind of just a, a, a different platform to, to share those ideas. All right, great. And before we, before we um, uh, ring off, uh, a couple of things. Uh, we've had, we have an executive producer on this session uh, Shay Riley, who's done a terrific job. We appreciate that. Shay is one of our uh, intrepid interns. Uh, Shay has another th uh, 20 days in Colorado before <laughs> she goes back to her studies in public policy. Is that right? Public planning. Uh, public well, planning. city planning. <laughs> uh, uh, public planning, city planning, urban planning, back to the University of Cincinnati. We appreciate your efforts as being executive producer and uh, wish well back in the Buckeye State. Uh, for those of you in the Buckeye State, go down to Cincinnati and, and she, uh, see Shay. Uh, <laughs> and Shay finishes her studies there uh, in Cincinnati uh, in May. Uh, we appreciate everything that you've done to help us here at CDOT. And uh, thank you again for helping with this forum. And again, we look forward to the forums in 2019. If you can present in February, that's great. We have some other executive producers around the table for the other sessions. You've already met Quentin. Uh, Tess is going to be executive producer for April. Uh, Mary, executive producer for the session in June. So if uh, February doesn't work out for you, but one of the other months, I'm sure they'd be, they would love to chat with you. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to all the interns who assisted on this um, whole process, putting this one together. Um, so that is it. Have a happy holidays, everyone.